Hey everyone. So in this session, we're going to talk about some of the basic properties of the sun, some of the different structural elements to it, the layers of the sun and its uh, and its uh, atmosphere. And in some subsequent sessions, we will talk about the in more detail about the nuclear reaction, the fusion reaction that's going on inside of the sun and some different aspects of solar weather. But at least for now, let's talk about some of the basic properties of the sun. I'm going to be throwing out a couple of numbers here as we describe some of this. I don't expect people to memorize any of these numbers, just kind of have ballpark estimates of some of them. So for example, when I say that the radius of the sun is about uh, just about 700,000 kilometers in radius. Well, when we compare that to the earth, that's about 109 times the earth's radius. Its mass, is around 300,000 times more massive than the Earth. Remember, we said the Sun was the vast majority of the mass in the solar system. Earth is puny compared to it. The luminosity. Well, let's talk about luminosity for just a second. Luminosity is basically the total light power output of a star. So the total light power output. And we're going to be looking at how we measure the luminosity of other stars, but our sun has luminosity of 3.8 times 10 to the 26 watts. We compare this with, say, a 100 watt light bulb. We know what a 100 watt light bulb looks like in terms of its brightness. This is 3.8 times 10 to the 26 watts, which is so much power output, one second of the sun's full power output would satisfy current worldwide energy needs for about the next 500,000 years. So again, the sun outputs a huge amount of energy. Uh, in terms of the composition, it's about 70% hydrogen, 28% helium, and 2% heavier elements. Other things further down the periodic table, carbon, oxygen, you know, elements like that. And this is actually going to be fairly similar to the composition of a lot of things that we look at in this course, a lot of other stars, a lot of other gas clouds in space. It's very often going to be about three quarters hydrogen, one quarter helium, and about 2% heavier stuff. The surface temperature is around 5,800 Kelvin. Core temperature around 15 million Kelvin. And we're gonna talk about how these temperatures are generated inside the core and, and the fusion reaction that's going on inside the core that actually powers the sun. We'll talk about that in more detail a little bit later. Again, I don't expect people to memorize these numbers, just kind of have a general ballpark, you know, comparison with the earth sort of understanding of these. In terms of the density of the sun, the sun doesn't really have any solid surface or in some ways any real distinction between the sun's what we call the sun's outer atmosphere and what we call the interior layers of the sun. In fact, for a fair amount of the sun's interior, if this is the what we call the surface of the sun and these are more and more of the inner layers, a lot of the sun is actually less dense than water. It's only when you really get into the core of the sun, into the inner part of what we're going to call the radiat radiative zone and the core of the sun, where you get the material inside the sun being compressed so much that it's reaching very, very high densities. Inside the core, we're talking over the density of gold till right in the core, it's around 10 times the density of lead. So what I want to do kind of quickly in this session is briefly go over the different layers of the sun, both the interior layers and the more outer parts of the sun's atmosphere. And for the interior of the sun, there are three general sections. So if I draw the sun and some of the sections in that sun, at the center, we have the core. This is the densest, hottest region. And this is the only region of the sun where nuclear fusion is actually taking place. The fusion reaction 
uh, hydrogen being fused into helium. This is the only region of the sun where that fusion reaction is taking place. So all of the energy that the sun produces, this is where that reaction is going on. So it's the highest temp and density. And it's where the fusion reaction takes place. So fusion takes place just in that core and it's gonna produce lots of high energy photons as a part of that energy generation. Again, the temperature is around 15 million Kelvin inside of the core of the sun. Moving outwards, we get the radiation zone or the radiative zone. What's happening in here, well, there's no more fusion taking place in this region. So here we have the radiative zone. Radiation zone. And here, the high energy gamma ray photons that are produced in the core, they're trying to gradually move out of the sun's inner layers. But in this region, we've got this very, very dense plasma. Well, actually, a, a fairly dense plasma, but there's lots of free electrons. And one thing about free electrons with this dense ionized plasma, photons love scattering off of free electrons. So as those high energy gamma ray photons are trying to fly through this material, all of the free electrons from that ionized plasma, they keep on scattering the photons in different directions. So even though those photons are still traveling at the speed of light, they move a little bit, bounce off a photon, move in get scattered in a new direction, new direction, new direction. And as they keep on bouncing through, they just gradually, gradually move through these this uh, radiation zone of the sun. So energy transported. Uh, by photons bouncing around. Maybe I'll give myself a bit more space. Energy transported uh, by bouncing photons. by randomly bouncing photons, or gamma rays, I should say. And this bouncing around process is so kind of gradually for how it makes its way out of the sun. It's estimated that it takes around 10, or sorry, 100,000 years for one of those gamma ray photons to gradually bounce its way through that radiation zone. So the energy that's produced inside of the core of the sun, it takes around 100,000 years for those gamma ray photons to actually make their way through this radiation zone. As we continue to move outwards, we get to what's called the convection zone. So if we move outwards a little bit more, we get to this convection zone. Let me label this. And in this region, well, the material isn't quite as dense. It flows a little bit more easily. And if you think of a convective oven, or if you've heard the word convection before, you know, pause the video and think of what, where have you heard the word convection before? Uh, in what context, what sort of physical mechanism is it? So pause the video and have a think about that. Well, when we talk about convective motion, the general principle for convective motion is that hot material, if I take some material and I heat it up, it will rise up. As that material rises up, it cools down, and then that material will sink back to the bottom. And it makes this broiling motion, this kind of bubbling, broiling motion that you see in boiling water or heat circulating through the house. Again, the basic idea is hot material rises, it reaches the surface, gradually cools off, and then sinks back down. And this is the way that energy is transported. So in the convection zone, we have energy transported uh, transported through convection. 
where hot material rises. and cool material sinks. And you, again, see this kind of motion when you boil a pot of water. You'll see the water uh, start to evaporate, turn into little uh, bubbles that rise upwards. Even before you actually get the boiling itself, hot material will rise, cool off and sink to the bottom, and it'll kind of give that little bubbly appearance on the surface of the water. And this literally happens to the sun. The uh, photosphere of the sun, which is kind of the first, what we kind of call edge layer, outer layer of the sun, um, the visible surface of the sun has this kind of bubbly appearance. This is a computer simulation of that hot material rising, reaching the top, cooling down, and sinking back in. Let me play a video. I'm gonna change my share so I can play a video of this actually happening on our sun. So this is a, a video clip from an observatory that's operated by apparently Stockholm University. Uh, let me play this. This is a 12 second clip and this is the photosphere of the sun and the bubbly motion that's happening because of those underlying convective layers. I'm think that this 12 second video covers a time period of about uh, a little over one hour. And on this scale, the United States would be about yay large. So we're not looking at an all that large of an area of the sun. Each of those bubbles, like a few of those bubbles would cover a significant portion of the United States. So this is the kind of uh, resulting appearance of the photosphere that we get because of those underlying convective layers. Again, the hot material rises, cools off, and then sinks down into these darker regions. Okay, so those are kind of the interior layers of the sun. So next, let's talk about the photosphere of the sun. This is the visible, quote-unquote, surface of the sun, even though it's not really a surface, it's a region of dense gas around 500 kilometers thick. Again, the sun doesn't really have, you know, a, a that clear of a definition between when the sun stops and when the sun's atmosphere begins. So this photosphere is kind of the boundary, but again, it's a 500 thick kilometer region, uh, 500 kilometer thick region. Its temperature is around 5,800 Kelvin. In this kind of an image, the brighter spots would correspond to the hotter spots. Think of the thermal radiation laws that we talked about, the Stefan Boltzmann law, where higher temperature objects are going to give off more light. And since that depends on temperature to the power of four, even if it's a little bit higher temperature, it gives off a lot more light. And again, this is where the light that we see from the sun comes from. Sometimes we'll see sunspots and even though in this image, the sunspot looks dark, that's because in order for this to work, you in order to make these kinds of telescopes work, you have to be extremely careful to put very, very effective filters on the sun, on the telescope. Um, I should say right now, never, ever attempt to look at the telescope with binoc or sorry, look at the sun with a telescope or binoculars that can burn out your retinas almost instantaneously if you try to focus that much light into your eyes. These telescopes are specifically designed to safely look at the sun. And these cooler sunspots that look dark, if you were right over top of them, they'd still be glowing bright, bright colors. Um, you, you definitely would not want to be around here. So again, we'll talk about more of the properties of the photosphere and things like solar weather in a little bit uh, in another session. So that's the, the photosphere. And then as you move to some of the outer regions of the sun's atmosphere, we've got the chromosphere, which is the kind of middle region of the solar atmosphere. And this is a region where we have a hot, thin gas. And these gases in the chromosphere are around 10,000 Kelvin. Well, if I have a high temperature, thin gas, an excited thin gas, when we talked about spectroscopy, we'll hopefully remember that a hot, thin gas will give off an emission spectrum. So 
these images of the chromosphere are specifically trying to dial in to some of the wavelengths that that emission spectrum is gonna give off strongly. That's how we can kind of look just at the chromosphere part instead of looking at all of the other parts of the sun as well. When we get to the sun's outer atmosphere, what we call the corona, this extends very, very far above the sun's surface for I, I think a couple solar radii is where the official definition of how far the sun's corona extends. And you can actually see this during a total uh, solar eclipse as these kind of wispy parts extending off of the sun. For reasons that we don't fully understand yet, these gases, these outer parts of the sun's atmosphere, this corona, the gases that make it up have been heated to around 1 million Kelvin. We think that this is due to somehow energy being transferred from the sun's magnetic fields to heat up these gases, but there are a lot of open questions. And currently there's a spacecraft called the Park Solar Probe that has actually gone partway into this corona and is starting to measure more and more of its properties. So we're currently, uh, astronomers are currently working to try to find out more about how these gases have reached this very, very high temperature. But this seems kind of counterintuitive that the outer parts of the sun's atmosphere would be that high a temperature. But it's also important to remember that these gases are very, very thin. If you had to decide between two unpleasant options, either putting your hand into boiling water or putting your hand into an open stove, uh, an open oven that was at, say, 400 Fahrenheit, which one would you go for? Well, I'd probably go with the oven because even though the temperature is higher, that's a thin gas. As long as I'm not like touching the element itself, that thin gas, it's not going to carry quite as much energy overall because, again, there's not as much mass there. So that's another thing to kind of consider when noticing that this is, that these gases in the corona are around a million Kelvin. Now, some of these charged particles, some of these excited charged particles in the corona can actually escape the corona and start flying through the solar, uh, the solar system as part of what we call the solar wind. And this solar wind can interact with Earth's magnetic field. It's the cause of the auroras or northern and southern lights. And again, when we talk about the solar weather, we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail. So again, those are the main parts of the sun. We've got the interior parts, the core, the radiation zone, the convection zone, and then we've got the outer parts of the sun, the photosphere, and then the, uh, the chromosphere and the corona. Now, before we end off this session, I wanna talk a little bit about a key property when we're gonna be looking at the properties of stars. And that is the idea of gravitational equilibrium. In a little bit of a simplified view, there are two main forces that are acting inside of the sun. There's a gravitational force that's trying to pull all of those pieces of the sun and are tr is trying to compress the sun. So for gravitational equilibrium, let me just kind of write this down. Gravitational equilibrium. We've got two forces. We've got gravity, which is trying to compress the sun. Versus, there's a pressure force. The fusion reaction that's going on inside of the sun, that produces very high temperatures inside the sun. And if you take a gas and you heat up that gas, that gas will tend to try to expand, will tend to expand if you heat that gas. And that produces some internal pressure for the sun. 
So we've got gravity versus this thermal pressure. And that's trying to um, expand the sun. So it's trying to expand. When we have this gravitational equilibrium, when we have a stable star like our own sun, these two forces, the inward force of gravity, the compressing force of gravity, and that expanding force of thermal pressure, that is balanced everywhere inside of the sun at all different layers. And again, we refer to this as a gravitational equilibrium. This is gonna be important when we understand the properties of our sun, when we understand the properties of other stars. And we're going to see certain kinds of stars in certain conditions where this gravitational equilibrium is not happening, where we have stars that are actually going through pulsations, or in some cases, stars that are expanding or stars that are violently exploding. We'll look at those later on in the course. But at least for now, our sun is in this gravitational equilibrium case. Another aspect of this is as you go deeper into the interior of the sun, then there's more and more stuff above that uh, in the outer layers of the sun that are being pulled down by gravity and trying to further and further compress the core. But that core is also the hottest part of the sun. So that's also going to have the greatest amount of pressure trying to push out and balance that inward gravitational force. So it's kind of like thinking of a, uh, a human pyramid. If I have one of these human pyramids at the top, if you're one of the people at the top, well, there's not very much stuff pushing down on you. So you don't have to push up as hard to support all the stuff above you. As you get deeper into the core, well, there's more stuff pushing down. So we need a greater pressure force pushing up to keep the system in balance. Another thing that happens is the weight of the upper layers of the star can actually compress the lower layers. So think of a giant stack of pillows. As I keep adding pillows to the top, those pillows on the bottom are going to become more and more compressed. This is why uh, earlier on, if we go back to uh, you know right near the beginning of this, this is why the interior regions of the sun and that core is at such a high density because the outer layers of the sun are compressing down so much that we end up with these very, very high densities inside the core. So let's think about this for a minute. We've got this star our sun, where there are gravitational forces that are constantly trying to crush the sun into oblivion. We've also got this nuclear reaction, this fusion reaction that's going on, that's producing enough temperature and enough outward thermal pressure that it's trying to blow the sun up. And every moment of every day, these forces are in nice balance with each other. That might sound terrifying. The sun is trying to simultaneously crush itself into oblivion and trying to explode. And that leads to an important question of what would happen if we slightly moved away from this perfect balance? You know, there are some balances that are nice and stable. Like if I take a pen and hold it like this, well, it's balanced. And if I kind of shake the thing a little bit, it stays balanced. Or I could have a balance where I try to balance the pen on its tip and any sort of motion to the side, it's going to fail catastrophically. We're hoping that our balance is stable. So let's talk about this one uh, really briefly. I'm going to mention this one again when we talk about the fusion reaction, but let me start with this. The fusion reaction that's going on in the core depends on the temperatures, and densities in the core. So let me write that down. A fusion reaction uh, the fusion reaction will increase with higher densities and higher temperatures in the core. Fusion reaction increases 
with higher core temperatures and densities. And this fact is actually going to allow us to have a stable core. So let's say we've got a balanced core. The inward force of gravity matches the outward force of pressure. Let's say for some reason, there's some little perturbation or disturbance or something that causes gravity to start to win out. So if there's too much gravity, gravity starts to compress the core. Well, if that core is being compressed, that means the density inside the core is going to increase. If there's a higher density inside of that core, that means there, the fusion reaction, the fusion reaction that's going on inside the core, that's going to increase. That increased fusion reaction is going to increase the thermal pressure and get us back to that nice stable state. Again, in the, one of the next sessions, we'll talk in more detail about what this fusion reaction is and how it works in more detail. But again, if I have too much gravity at one point and the, de and the core starts to collapse, that fusion reaction at that higher density will start to run faster and faster and reestablish that balance. Let's say the fusion reaction gets going way, way too quick and that core starts to expand. Well, if there's too much pressure, that core starts to expand and the density of the core decreases. The density of the core decreases. So those particles that are the hydrogen that's fusing into helium, that fusion reaction, it's not going to run as quickly. So if there's too much fusion, the core expands a little bit, the density goes down, and that will decrease the fusion reaction and will slow down that fusion reaction, leading to decreased thermal pressure, and we're back to a nice balance. So it's, it's really comforting to know that our sun has this nice kind of built-in thermostat mechanism where if gravity starts winning out, the, the density in the core will increase, more fusion, we get back to a balance. If the fusion's running too quickly, the core expands, density decreases, rains in that fusion reaction, and we get back to this nice balanced core. So by purely just you know physical means, just how the sun seems to operate and obeying the laws of physics, we have this nice stable star. So in some of the next sessions, we'll talk about the details of the fusion reaction that's going on inside the sun, and some of the properties of solar weather and how that affects us here on the Earth.